thought, yeah, now uh, what we should do is probably uh, talk about wells. You know, many people think that geophysics is just seismic, is so fantastic that, uh, you know, you can do everything with it. And, you know, they love the fact, you know, you can do things like play with your color palettes and impress managers and zoom in and out. And so they think, you know, geophysics uh, or seismic is the answer to everything. And so I'm afraid that in the real world, as Mr. Chris says, you know, without the well control, I'm not going to say your seismic is useless, but it's very limited in value. If I mean, obviously, you can see where structural highs are. You can reconstruct some history, et cetera. So remember, the best seismic interpreter is the one who has looked at the most wells. And by the way, the best geologist is the one who has looked at the most seismic lines. That's, uh, that's how it works. So here's our Stratton 3D. And you know we picked some horizons uh, up shallow. We did a, a little bit of picking, et cetera. But you know, so this is fantastic. So you know, we could get these horizons and uh, whatever. Let's pick one here. And uh, you know, we can look at those and, and we can uh, extract uh, amplitudes and we can do all sorts of wonderful things. We can create uh, all sorts of things. But until I have tied the wells, it's, it's just a starting point. So, I mean, we talked about depth conversion, but uh, uh, you've got to tie everything else in the wells. So once you turn this on, so here we are, you could have done all this great work in Stratton, but suddenly you see that, well, I have a bunch of wells. So me as a poor geophysicist, you know, I wanted to do a 60 dimensional cross plot, you know, 60 seismic attributes and find the oil is and darn, now I have to actually work with wells. Uh, so it's really important to um, understand the well. So I'll just show you a few things that I do. And again, this happens to be in Kingdom. Um, all workstations have variations on these functionalities, but what I'll often do is I will come in and just make a table of some key information. Now in this particular data set, um, for example, okay, let's uh, take things like our, our tops. Um, I want to know what logs I have in this well, right? Because uh, before my petrophysicist begins working, um, that's, that's something I need to know, etc. So here in Kingdom, for example, there's a, there's a nice feature where basically you can go in here and you can pick all sorts of things. You can put well information too, like the total depth of the well, latitude and longitude. So let's throw one of these in here. Let's throw an X and Y. And really you've got controls here, a number of decimal places if for depth and time, you know, actually depth, I don't really need a lot of decimal places, et cetera. And then basically you say, okay, and here's your information from your wells. So, so the first step in working with wells is actually you have to get very organized. And so I want to know how many wells have been picked, what depths are these tops occurring at? And now to Mr. Chris's points, you know, so of course he's a, he's Excel, he's used to having fantastic sonic logs and density logs on every single well, right? With shear waves, et cetera. But again, in the real world, uh, you don't always get what you want. And so this is a case of these logs that are available for this particular area. So we can see here, SP logs are very common. Gamma rays were recorded on most. Now you can see multiple mnemonics as they call them. Sometimes gamma ray from one uh, vendor is called GRD from somebody else. But of course we're looking, let's say as ge geoscientists or geophysicists, row B, I see a good, lots of densities but almost no sonic. In fact, I see one sonic and I see somebody apparently has done a Faust equation to convert that. So, but an inventory like this is, is uh, really critical. You'll also see here that sometimes they've got uh, RT, which is the, uh, the deep resistivity and you've got some others. But again, I, I encourage you to do kind of an inventory like this early on. And usually you have the option to export this. And actually you even have the option literally uh, to copy and paste into Excel. So I like this functionality and this is often what I do at the beginning. So the next thing that I like to do is when I have a map active is I wanna see where my data falls. So wells post data on map. 
And this is much more important than the 60 dimensional cross plot, by the way, of 60 seismic attributes. This allows me to post a variety of information. And again, we're not gonna go through it all, but uh, it's very important usually to know the UWI of your well. Now, in this case, these are pseudo UWIs because uh, this data set has been, uh, what do you call it, sanitized so that it's not in its true geographic location, but you know, unique well identifier, total depth, et cetera. So when I begin a project, I spend a lot of time posting data on map, depending on what it is. So um, as I say, I'm not gonna show it all, but you know, if, if you've got a comprehensive workstation project, it'll tell you spud date. Does it have a time depth chart, et cetera, et cetera. So post data on map, very important. Let's take the, um, take the UWI out, I think. Okay, so that's that, apply. Okay, so the next thing is post data along borehole. <clears throat> that's another thing. Now, in this case, these happen to be all vertical wells, but very commonly, including most of your areas, we're going to give you wells with deviation surveys, which means that, uh, and, and this is of course very important if you work in a horizontal or resource place, but uh, one thing I often do is post, especially where the wells are deviated. So if I'm studying the C38 uh, formation top, I wanna see that on the map. And there it is. And so you can see C38, and I can decide what I'm going to post on that map. And of course, what color I'm gonna show, et cetera here. So let's put that in blue. So I, because uh, I already know what this is, I'm not gonna put its name, but you can notice here that I can record the time and depth of these tops. And let's just say whatever, if I'm working in depth, I'm mostly, you know, this could be applicable by the way to the North Sea team. So right here, I am now looking at the C38 that let's say I have a horizon picked and now I have all those tops posted. And so very important. And of course you can post by the way, multiple tops if you want. So let's just pick a few, move them to the right. And there we go. There's all your tops in a given well. So when you guys in the North Sea are working your models or whatever, you'll be able to come in here and you'll be able to record in this case, you can see horizon F11 or, or marker to be exact, F11 is 1.527 seconds, uh, which is at uh, 6,019 feet. Okay, so that's really important. So again, you know, so much of this is about getting the well information organized at the beginning before you, you get too carried away on lots of attributes and even bright spots and things. Until you've done this, you, you're not yet ready to be doing that kind of work. Okay, let's go back and look at one other aspect. So wells, post data on map. And of course, like we say, each workstation will do this in a slightly different way. Uh, so now I'm gonna take the total depth off and I'm gonna do attribute map. Because this is, if I want to know which wells have a C38 top in there, I now know, right? So if I'm trying to study the C38 and I want to make an arbitrary line, probably let's say at first, that's going to tie these wells. And if I also want to do the E41, that's your wells that have uh, those tops. So in this particular case, uh, these tops are available. So again, this is very important because once I have this, then I'm in a position to start building cross sections the other way I use this particular functionality, we talked about the logs, right? So let's come here, log curve name list. And now, you know, I like to see a gamma ray if I can. I want wells that have a gamma ray. And of course I want a well that has row B so we can keep Mr. Chris happy here. And of course I want a sonic log of which we're going to give one color here. Let's go say brown on this one. And this Faust velocity, well, whatever, maybe it's not great, but it, it's something. So let's put that, let's say show legend here, etc. Okay. Uh, Alan, to make me really happy, I would like to see resistivity too. Okay, well, we'll, we'll put that on here in just a second. Let me do that. No, no we, we always want to keep, uh, keep uh, our colleagues happy here. So uh, 
anyway, but you can see immediately that, for example, if I wanted to do synthetics, then there are certain zones of the 3D. I don't want to waste my time on these particular wells. I want to go straight to those, but let's come here. We always try and keep our audiences happy here in Evolve. And let's come back to our attribute map and let's go back to lot curve name list. And we're going to go say RT, right? Is that okay with you? Apply. There we go. So some wells there, there's one well that actually, so it doesn't have everything, right? So it's, it's got a density log, it's got a gamma ray, but no sonic and no resistivity. And so anyway, this is a very important technique. And um, now what I didn't show you is there was another tab in there that was uh, bubble maps. And we're not gonna talk about production today, but what I will often do as part of these early stages, we said it's important to find out what's significant and what isn't. I like to make bubble maps. Okay, so here we go. So now we know which, uh, which wells have which data. And so now, because now behind the scenes, see, this is a bit like the, uh, the cooking shows on TV, right? There's some things that have gone on in the background here. But what we have had in here, obviously, like when Mr. Chris was talking a moment ago about the two domains, I have depth data that is showing up in time here. So there's a piece of information I haven't told you about, but obviously there's some time depth functions um, that are controlling this. And so each of these wells does have a time depth function. And of course you could not be doing this if you didn't have that. So let's just talk about this briefly. So let's come here to time depth charts. And just to reassure you, there really is some time depth data. There we go. And uh, there's our time depth function in here. So this is, uh, you can see that's well number one, number two. So, you know, before we began, we had these time depth functions. And remember, this is what we're sending you. We are sending you check shot pairs just like this. So just like, again, back to, to Mr. Chris's point, you've got these time depth pairs, but I can also turn on, you can see, I have the option to turn on interval velocity, average velocity, et cetera. So, you know, there's, uh, there's average. Let's go back to interval. And then of course I can, turn my tops on and off to see how the tops are tying, et cetera. Okay, so that was just to see that, you know, uh, it wasn't necessarily magic that uh, we had actually done some work before. Uh, can I ask you a quick question? Of course, yes, please. Um, so this uh, average velocity and interval velocity that we are seeing on this chart is not the corrected one, right? So after um, seismic well tie, that's, um, the correct interval velocity and average um, velocity that we can find. Is that correct? I mean, you have to go through the well tie procedure to bring everything back. And that, that is the well tie process. And um, so these, I'm trying, you know, this is a public domain data set. I'm trying to remember what the source, I think these were real check shots. Um, so they should be okay, but they could be shifted slightly up and down. Yes, in the real world, they may not tie perfectly. And of course, yeah. in fact- And it looks like the data has been acquired below fairly deep casing point, only in the objective section. So we're making right now an assumption, what's the velocity of the overburden? Only with the process of well tie, you can determine it as an average velocity of the overburden. Okay. So well tie is going to constrain all these uncertainties that you see here in the data uh, now. Okay, great, thank and, you. And maybe in part to answer your question, again, remember this is the real world, by the way, I'm doing the high wire act here. I, I, I didn't necessarily, but to answer your question, okay, so we took these check shots, which are usually fairly reliable measurements, right? I've picked my horizon, which is in time, that is truth, right? Not necessarily in depth, but in time it's truth. And now I see these tops picked by our trusty geoscience geologist, C38, C38, C38. So, okay, so now I recognize there's something that doesn't work, right? Because in an ideal world, C38 
would at least remain a consistent distance from the red. It doesn't necessarily have to be on my red horizon, but hopefully it should be consistent. So I know something now is not quite right. Now, it could be my geoscientist or geologist has picked incorrectly, right? I mean, in fact, this pick looks maybe a little bit high. It could be my time depth function is off or my well tie is off in one of these wells. In some cases, of course, if there are faults, it could be that your seismic picking across the fault was incorrect. That's not an issue up here, but it sure could be an issue down here in the deeper part of the section where we have a lot of faults. So once you start getting in here, all bets are off that your horizons are going to be correct across the fault. But notice now that we've started to look at the well data. Now, one thing is in these well displays, and I've, I already did it in this case, but um, of course you can control all these tracks so we can control what's being shown. And I often like to come in and put a simple shading. And so I like to pick a cut off and have two colors. So like in this case, gamma ray constant shading um, below the 100 gamma ray units, I have a yellow in this case. And above it, actually, I leave it turned off right now. Now, there are many solutions to this, but this, for example, allows me to quickly see where my more sandy zones. And of course, as always, some of this is trial and error, right? Well, maybe I want to change my cutoff to uh, 120. Does that help me recognize the sands more or less? That may be a little too far, see? So let's leave that at maybe 110, apply. And, uh, you know, you could also, if you wanted to, let's say if I wanted to see the more shale prone zones, let's put a green in here, emphasize the shales, and there you go. So here, through this very simple linear cutoff, I can already start to see what's going on in terms of, this is a big fat shale package overall, right? I may have some, some thin sands in there, but, you know, this, I could already tell, having tied my wells, I would not spend my time picking 15 different horizons between D11 and F21 because that's going to be shale and I'll have nice structures perhaps, but I'm not gonna have any reservoir. And you know, this upper zone could almost be the opposite. Maybe here I've got so much sand, maybe I don't even have any seal in here. But again, notice this is the kind of work you can be doing early on. And that's when we said the geologists should do their work come back to this geophysicist or the interpreter, etc. By the way, there are far more sophisticated techniques you can use here. You can use facies shading, color shading. But like I say, early on, I like just a simple cutoff. And since uh, Mr. Chris happened to measure resistivity, you see, I actually had color coded red, I believe. Actually, red, let me see here, is... Um, well, I called it test, but this is where I went through and did a quick calculation of acoustic impedance. How did I do that? And so basically in this particular workstation, you come to logs, calculations, and equation, which gives you a calculator with a whole range of functionality, by the way, our, our petrophysical friends can do all sorts of things, but me being just a poor geophysicist, uh, I'm gonna keep it really uh, simple. So I'm just gonna say AI equals uh, whatever, A, A times B, which will be density times velocity. There we go. And then here's the key point or A times V doesn't matter. So I'm gonna tell it that A, so you have to assign the curve. So because I want density, which is rho B to be A, let's go rho B. And here's the key point, click assign, and the arrow comes in. Now I know that uh, actually, and that's not, I don't want RT, I want row B, assign. And then we'll pretend the next one here, V is velocity. And we'll take this, in this case, velocity from Faust, assign, next. And then these are things where you can control where you're gonna do your calculations. Like if you only wanna do your calculations between zones, uh, you would control it up in here. You can even go above and below, but usually I just do the whole thing, zero to 9999, whatever. And uh, okay, so now I'm gonna call this uh, 
Remember, that was the general formula we were setting up, but this is the final name I want to give it. So I want to give it AB, my own acoustic impedance, and log type. Uh, there we go. We have a category for acoustic impedance. Create a new one, finish. And there it is. So if I try a cross plot, hopefully that log will be in there. Tools, cross plot new. And the only thing is it's got to be a well now that had the, the, the Faust and this one does. So now if I want to do a cross plot gamma ray against the, the acoustic impedance I just created here. And let's say show neutron porosity on the sandstone matrix, apply. There we go. We turn on our color palette. And so we now can understand how does the acoustic impedance compare with gamma ray. And the key here, by the way, <clears throat> and again, you know, we're kind of looking at this together. Of course, to the right is the shale. The, the more you go to the right, the shalier you are in here. The more you go to the left, the more you're sandy. Now notice your sands here have high acoustic impedance. So for all of those of you who hopefully have memorized Mr. Forrest's talk on bright spots, class three or your typical bright spots, the sands are usually lower impedance than the shales. So we can already tell this is not bright spot country right here uh, because at least quick first look, we'd have to double check some other things. But uh, first impression is our, uh, our sands, which is what we're after, are actually going to be higher impedance. So they're gonna be peaks. So when we do our well ties, that's gonna be the case. So let's come in here and quickly digitize a polygon. Okay, in here. So if I'm most interested in the sands in here, I wanna see where are all my sands. Of course, again, this cross plot and polygon functionality is very powerful. And of course, you know, I can give it whatever. We'll just call this sands. And we learned we want to have a thicker line so we can see it. And let's make our pattern. Now we'll leave that pattern, but we'll put a color to be, say, gold in here. So there are our sands. So this confirms what we saw earlier. You know, there's a shaley zone in here. Obviously, we're not looking at sands. And then these are all our sands in here. And because we can play with this polygon on the fly, if we wanted low impedance sands where those might have a possibility of being bright spots. So let's come down here. I want low acoustic impedance and I want sands. And guess what? Those tend to be the shallow ones. See, and there's a few deeper ones. So these, depending on which shale you're against. Now you can see if you had these sands currently in here, and your immediately adjacent shales were the ones to the right. So we've already made note, Some, somebody make a note, our, our low impedance, relatively low impedance sands fall between what, 45 and we'll call it 5,000. That's where most of them are. And there's one at whatever, 63. If I read my value lower left, then my value 6390, we'll call it 6400. Let's just try moving this polygon to the shale region and see what, okay, there we go. So what we're saying is that uh, where the shales would have the exact same or very close to the same acoustic impedance as the shallow sands is actually deeper. So um, now I got to kind of move this around. Let's go see if I can find where these others are. Okay, so these are almost all, let's look here, deeper. Yeah, that's the big shale unit here. Anyway, I think uh, the main point here is with this polygon functionality and the ability to kind of move it around and so on, it lets you very quickly understand your rock properties. And again, you can use it to help when you're actually looking at these well log cross sections, et cetera, you know what response you should be expecting. And that will help you understand whether you should be looking for a peak or a trough in any given situation. And that's how I calculated acoustic impedance. And so in this case, 
Now, because I'm looking for what could be causing my seismic signals, you know, I, I highlighted through a cutoff my higher impedance zones in here, for example, that in principle, going from low impedance to high impedance, this will usually be a peak if I've got a uniform interval up above. So uh, anyway, that was just uh, showing how you can do these quick calculations usually. Another thing I like to do is, let's go tools, cross plot, because this is all about understanding the different rock properties. And uh, let's see, these are my wells. Let's pick a well in here. And I often like to see how, for example, my different rock properties. So if I do a cross plot, resistivity versus uh, gamma ray. And I've got, in this case, neutron porosity, I'll put as a third one. There we go. So there are my logs. And so now we're starting to relate, for example, gamma ray to resistivity here. Put a color palette here. And I can start to relate. So this is neutron porosity. So the red is very low porosity here. And uh, as we move towards the yellow, uh, we're moving to the, uh, the neutron porosity on the sandstone matrix. Zoom out. So here's the other key thing you can do. So let's see if I want to understand for example, how a particular interval is in here. So for example, my lower porosity zone, then basically you can come in here, digitize a polygon, find an area of interest here. Let's say these points that are kind of anomalous looking, name A. And hopefully it will zoom out. And there it is. So there's my polygon, a little bit small here. Make the line a little bit thicker so you guys can see it. Apply, there it is. And so once I look at my anomalous faces or whatever it is, I can move the polygon around and I can see, of course, which piece of the logs that corresponds to. So I think that's probably enough uh, since I know we're a bit over schedule, but again, I wanted to emphasize that it's, it's really important to get to that well data. Until then, these are just little wiggles that you can color in many different ways and they're beautiful and I can find anomalies, but they don't mean anything until you've started tying in all that well information.